Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barbara Riles. I'm news director for KBJR, KDLH, CW, and My9. My9 is going to be carrying this broadcast live right now and also again tonight at 7. I'll remind you of that before we go. Today's debate is sponsored by Debate Minnesota along with the Minnesota State College Student Association. The Debate Minnesota Board of Directors are from different backgrounds and political persuasions. However, they all share a common concern about the impact of negative advertising and money in politics and the lack of civility in our political discourse. Debate Minnesota proposes that we take a lesson from Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas and carry our issues back to the public square where the real power lies in the nation with you, the people. And as with the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858, they believe the best way to restore civility in an election process is through content-rich, in-depth discussions of ideas and issues that are important to, to all of the people. We'll begin our debate with uh, one-minute opening statements from each candidate. The participants had a coin toss a moment ago backstage to determine the order. <clears throat> each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question with a one-minute follow-up. The order will rotate throughout the debate, and each candidate will be given the opportunity to make a one-minute closing statement. We want to thank our timekeepers, their students out there in the audience, Morgan and Maria, for helping us keep us on schedule and on track. When you look out there, they'll have their signs and help you keep on, on time and on schedule. And we wish to remind you now, and this is important to all of you, Please hold your applause until the conclusion of today's debate. We're asking for no cheers, no jeers, no signs. I think you had to leave your signs outside. And I, I have been asked to tell you that if there is a disruption, we have police here, and apparently they will escort you out. So I ask you to please um, follow the rules and be civil, as I'm sure you all will be. All right, gentlemen, are you ready? Ready. All right. Ready. And our, our first... Uh, question will go to Congressman Kravak. The national debt in the United States is currently very close to $16 trillion, I'm sure you're aware. Unemployment across the country currently sits at 7.8%. Some have called us nearing a fiscal cliff. What it's going to take to set this country in a better direction, I want you to tell me whether it's spending cuts, tax increases, or some alternative suggestion. I'm sorry, I've forgotten to give you your opening statements, and we don't want to, to jeopardize the uh, Debate Minnesota protocol here. So each of you gets a one-minute opening statement, and we'll start with you. Keep that question in mind. We'll come back to it. <laughs> Mr. Kovac. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Appreciate it. It's truly a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you for taking your time uh, out of your busy days to be with us. Uh, if I could, before we start, let's just take a moment and think about our fellow Americans that are on the East Coast right now uh, enduring uh, Hurricane Sandy and all the trials and tribulations, and our thoughts and prayers go out to them. Uh, it's truly been an honor and a privilege to serve these last couple years. And through these last couple years, we've been able to put out some pretty dynamic pro-growth, pro-job legislation that is specific to the range. Like, for example, our Buy American Steel Amendment. That is an uh, amendment that makes sure that American, project, uh, American steel is used by American workers on American projects. Our expediting of our procedures for getting out uh, for like PolyMet and also Twin Metals, which is going to bring a lot of jobs in the district. My goal is to bring jobs into the 8th District of Minnesota, good paying jobs. I want to be the Bakken fields of precious metal mining and taconite mining. It's truly been a privilege and an honor. I look forward to it. Uh, last, the newspapers have been endorsing us for our vision of the future along with our constituent services. I uh, thank Debate Minnesota for Barbara for being here today with us. I also thank the college for hosting us and I of course thank Congressman, for being here as well, and I look forward to a spirited and issue-oriented debate. Thank you. Mr. Nolan. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, begin, if I could, by um, thanking everyone, uh, the sponsors, uh, Congressman Kravak, uh, the audience, the media, for partaking and uh, making this uh, debate possible. And um, like Chip said, I, I hope we, and I'm sure we will have a spirited uh, issue-oriented debate. I would like to introduce my uh, my hunting and fishing partner, uh, my number one advisor, uh, my best friend, and um, uh, my wife of the last 28 years, uh, Mary Nolan. Um, I am uh, a fourth-generation native here of the uh, 8th Congressional District, the Iron Range, uh, the Cuyuna Range. My family's been here for six generations. 
I have, uh, was born here, raised here, uh, raised my family here, built my business here. Um, I am an integral a part of this district. I know there's no legal requirement for anything of that sort, but it helps make you a good representative for the district. And that's the view and, that I intend to bring to Washington, and I look forward to debating the issues. We've got a pretty good choice in this one, and I'm looking forward to the debate. All right, back to the fiscal cliff, because that's what uh, some are saying the nation is headed for. And if you could start, uh, uh, Mr. Kovac, talking about um, what it's going to take to set this country back on a safer path. And, and my opinion is a pro-growth tax reform, which we have passed in the House, making a simpler, flatter, fairer system, and to incentivize, especially the small business owner, for creating jobs. Uh, seven out of ten people are employed by small businesses in the eighth, uh, or in, throughout the country. I would probably say that's higher in the 8th District. So we have to incentivize those small businesses to create those jobs, to have the confidence again to expand and create jobs. Also in the corporate region, we need to bring down, we have the highest corporate tax rates in the world. We need to bring those down to at least 25%, which is a global average. I would even presume it might be a little bit lower to incentivize businesses that have gone offshore to come back to the United States. Because when I talk to CEOs and COOs, they want to bring jobs back to the United States. But we have a very complicated tax code, and we, uh, the amount of regulations and restrictions are truly impeding growth within the United States. So my, my, my feeling is to have a pro-growth tax reform along with simplifying the uh, amount of uh, regulations and restrictions that are being placed on our small business owners. Uh, that is the way to the recovery of expanding jobs. Now, when you want to increase taxes, even Bernie Marcus said that even a brain-dead economist knows that when you increase taxes, it's at the cost of jobs. Uh, the proposed tax increases by the current administration uh, is telling us that it's going to affect over 53 percent of small business income. Now, Ernst & Young has come out with a, a, an independent study saying if that is to occur, then uh, it is going to be at the cost of 710,000 jobs through, throughout the country. Every job is vitally important, and we have to give the confidence to the small business owner to expand and create those jobs, to create the demand that we all want to start moving this economy forward. Mr. Nolan. Um, Pro-growth uh, tax reform and policies, as the congressman refers to, has become really a euphemism for letting the rich get richer while the poor get poorer and the middle class in this country uh, gets crushed. Clearly, we are in a fiscal crisis. Um, I uh, reject the notion that Medicare and Social Security are in any way responsible for that. On the contrary, there may be some problems there, and we know how to go about fixing them. But there's other factors that have gotten us into this uh, financial uh, crisis that we're in. We need to stop the war in Afghanistan and stop it now in the so-called nation building abroad. Uh, they're costing us trillions of dollars. We need to balance our budget and to start rebuilding uh, America, our roads, our bridges, our, our schools, our hospitals. Uh, quite frankly, uh, we need to do away with the uh, tax cuts uh, for the super rich uh, in this country country. Again, use that money to balance our budget, uh, start rebuilding America. We need to do away with the uh, tax cuts that provide incentives for companies and corporations to move their jobs and their manufacturing uh, overseas and reverse that, incentivize them to uh, do their manufacturing uh, here at home uh, where it belongs and where it creates uh, good jobs. There is so much that needs to be done uh, here in America. And if we do that, we will put together a real, true, a pro-growth economy that, that creates jobs, uh, that improves the quality of our life, uh, that balances our budget, that puts our fiscal house in order. And that's the task before us, and that's what we have to do. Thank you. Mr. Kovac, do you have a follow-up? I do. Um, you know, the thing about it is we have a plan. We have a plan that passed the House. It's uh, waiting for action on the Senate uh, we have a plan. I would love to entertain another plan, even to take a look at it, but quite frankly, there is no other plan. Uh, we have a plan that has passed the House and moving forward. And it's kind of, we, we've heard this before. I mean, Geithner came to, uh, to one of the committee meetings and says, uh, we don't have a plan. We don't have a solution. We know we just don't like yours. Well, let's have another plan. Love to take a look at another plan. But uh, as, far, as far as I know, and our, the economists are telling us by uh, having a pro-growth tax uh, reform uh, 
along with eliminating the spending, is going to create jobs in this country. That is how you create jobs, by reining in uh, our excessive tax code and excessive amount of regulations and restrictions that impede the small business owner and corporations, for that matter, of creating jobs in this country. Mr. Nolan, do you have a follow? Well, I would uh, certainly you have a plan. It's called the Ryan uh, plan. We call it here the Ryan Cravac plan. Um, but what it provides for is more spending on the military, uh, less spending on domestic development. It provides for the elimination of uh, uh, Medicare as we know it. It uh, provides for cuts in things like uh, Pell Grants for kids to go to great uh, colleges uh, like we have here. Um, and it provides for an expanding of military spending and an expansion of tax cuts for the super rich. The corporations in America are already sitting on several trillions of dollars. Um, the banks are sitting on several trillions of dollars. They don't need more tax cuts. What they need is an economy that rebuilds this middle class. We need to do away with this trickle-down economics that are uh, destroying uh, this economy and uh, the opportunities that have normally been associated with the American experience. We need to build this country from the middle out and from the bottom up, not from the top down. All right, staying with the, the topic of national spending for a minute here, according to the Budget Control Act on January 2nd, unless Congress intervenes, a 10-year $600 billion across-the-board spending cut will hit the Pentagon. That would cut about 8% from its current budget. Mr. Nolan, what's your position on that? Well, I think we've gotten ourselves into sequestration or uh, this fiscal cliff as a result of the fact that the Congress has not done its job. Uh, I served in the Congress uh, representing part of the 8th District here uh, earlier in, in my life, and quite frankly, we worked uh, 48 out of 52 weeks. Uh, this Congress, I believe, worked... Uh, 32 out of 52 weeks, um, for the most part worked uh, a couple days a week. And uh, they point fingers at one another, yeah, the Senate won't go along with us, and the Senate saying the House won't go along with us. And uh, the fact is that this has been recognized nationally as probably the most non-productive Congress maybe uh, in the history of the United States. And I think it's irresponsible to allow this sequestration uh, to go forward. Uh, to be sure, there needs to be cuts in federal spending. But as we look at a changing economy, a changing uh, uh, culture, uh, the new discoveries, the new technologies, the constant evolution of things. We always have to be looking at our government selectively and, and not engaging in, uh, in across-the-board cuts. But uh, I'm a businessman. Uh, I, I know about budgets and uh, the importance of balancing them. And the fact is, you, you, you don't just do across-the-board cuts. You, you, you cut where you're not getting a return on your investment, and you invest more where you are getting a return on your investment. And that's what we need to do here. So, uh, Chip, well, regardless of the outcome of this election, I, I that uh, uh, if you... Uh, well, you will be the congressman until the end of the year. And I hope you guys will go back into session, uh, go to work, and, and, and do the job that needs to be done and make the selective cuts where they need to be and, uh, and quite frankly, do expanding uh, spending if you see an area where we can get a better return on our dollar. Mr. Kravak? Uh, and sticking with the issue in regards to uh, the budget itself, um, all due respect, Congressman, you're just wrong in the aspect that you know, under, under the uh, – for military spending, we will have the lowest spending in the percentage of GDP since 1948 at 3.65%. And involving overseas contingency funding, that is under the President's bill, is only 2.7% of the budget. So in no way would even begin to, to, uh, to eliminate the, the uh, actual defi deficit spending. Um, one of the concerns, I voted against the Budget Control Act for one of the major couple of concerns. One is right before the vote, uh, Standard & Poor's came in and said, if you vote for this bill, uh, we, are, we are going to downgrade you. Uh, I took them at their word. And sure enough, after we voted for the bill, which I voted against, uh, Standard & Poor's came out, and for the first time in the United States history, the creditworthiness of the United States was downgraded. In addition to that, sequestration across the board cuts. I'm a Naval Academy graduate. I just so happened to have my 30th uh, Naval Academy reunion. A couple of my buddies now have stars on their shoulders. I asked them what would sequestration do to them. Uh, they told it would directly impact the ability for them to fulfill the mission of uh, protecting the United States. 
I also took them at that word, their word as well. What sequestration will do to our national defense is that it will, we will have the lowest ground forces since 1940, the smallest Navy since 1915, and the smallest Air Force in the existence of its history. Uh, I'm also on Homeland Security. I can tell you that the threats of the United States have not diminished since 9-11. They have increased. And now is not the time to be cutting back our military. The United States military did not cause this deficit and this debt. We should not bear on the backs of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines the recovery. Mr. Nolan, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, well, Chip, the fact is the military uh, spending has increased, and uh, you just have to look at the mathematics. And we're talking about balancing the budget here. We're not talking about how one thing is relative to another relative to the GDP. Uh, military spending has gone up. And uh, I couldn't agree more with you that we need to make sure that the men and women who serve our country are paid well and taken well care of. But that doesn't mean, Chip, that we need to spend $50 billion air conditioning the uh, green zone in Baghdad. That doesn't mean we need to uh, move, spend $20 billion moving the military base in uh, downtown uh, Okinawa to rural Okinawa so they won't uh, uh, see it. Um, it doesn't mean we need another $30 billion uh, base in uh, the Northern Marianas. There are ways that we can cut military spending. We spent a trillion dollars in Iraq. We spent a trillion dollars um, in um, Afghanistan. And to, to suggest that that hasn't contributed to the financial crises that we're in is just to ignore the realities of Mr. the cost Mr. of Kovac, those wars of choice. Do you have a follow-up? Our overall spending within the last couple of years alone has increased uh, 29%. We're expecting, because of sequestration, to take a trillion dollars out of our national defense. This affects everybody in this room, whether Republican, Democrat, Independent. The national security of the United States will be severely diminished according to the commanders. Now, an interesting note, when Admiral Mike Mullen was in uh, Congress, uh, or when he was a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when we came in Congress for a committee, when asked, what is, your what is the chief threat of the United States? He didn't say a nuclear Iran, he didn't say the communist Chinese. What he did say, the chief threat of the United States is our debt. And I believe him. I want to bring this question a little closer to home. Um, one of the Northland's most valuable assets is the 148 fighter wing. Um, with those kind of cuts that, that could happen, uh, what would you do to make sure that the Duluth-based uh, 148th Air Guard stays stable? Mr. Kovac. Uh, we've worked very closely with the 148 of the Bulldogs in uh, addressing this issue. As a matter of fact, when they were trying to take the 24-hour alert mission away from uh, the 148th, uh, I had uh, General Norby in, in the office explaining to me why that uh, they picked the 148th. And unfortunately, it was, a, it was bean counters that were making the decision rather than the tactical information of the squadron itself. Uh, the 148th is a unique, fantastic squadron. Uh, it flies Block 50 aircraft. Um, they have 24-hour alert missions. Uh, they not only do it in uh, Duluth area, but they do it around the world, and they do it better than anybody else. Uh, I've had, I have my 9G pin. I was able to go fly with those guys and pull 9Gs, and they are the best of the best. Uh, now, in addition to that, uh, by making it an active association, by because our, our guys that are on the one, gals that are on the 148th, they truly are the experts on those Block 50 aircraft. Uh, they break them down completely and then bring them, uh, put them right back together again. They're exceptional uh, airmen. Uh, they truly are the brain chest when it comes to that Block 50, where your active duty guy, you know, has three eight years here, three years there. So by making it an active association, which makes it a more solid squadron and solid command, um, by making them an active association, the uh, the, the uh, active guard, duty guard guys are training the active duty guys um, on how best to perform maintenance on the uh, on the Block 50 aircraft. So I think by making it this an active duty uh, association, along with we put a moratorium on General Norby uh, making a decision, uh, we, wanted, we, we sent him back to the drawing board and we said, hey, make a tactical decision. Don't make a bean counter decision. I think the 148th will do just fine. Mr. Nolan, what's your position? Would the 148th be stable? Well, I think the, the 148th... Uh, 
the fighting flying division is very important uh, for our national defense. Um, they're in the air 24 hours, uh, seven days a week, and the F-16s providing uh, important and vital uh, air protection and defense for our country. This is where we need to spend our money instead of air conditioning the uh, the. the the green zone in, in Baghdad. And additionally, it's of course, it's a tremendous asset uh, for the city of Duluth to have it here on, on our northern border, our northern frontier. Um, there's some thousand members, I believe, and I think at least half of them or close to that are active duty. Um, there's a, uh, uh, I, I think they add about something about 90 or $100 million to the economy of Duluth. And while they're uh, busy uh, providing important and vital national defense for us, uh, here in this country, uh, they're also, uh, you know, very much engaged and involved in the community in providing a wide range of services uh, that are uh, very helpful, very important to the community. That's where we need to be spending our, uh, our defense dollars, where we're really getting a good bang for our buck and we're not in some faraway uh, land in some nook and cranny of the world uh, providing, uh, uh, trying to be policemen of the world. We're providing some real national defense and in a way that contributes enormously also to our community at the same time. Well, I thought maybe we'd found an agreement on an issue, but then I saw that little smile, so maybe you do have a follow-up. Uh, no, I was actually sp uh, smiling because I said, look, we have bipartisan agreement right here. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, so maybe we don't need a follow-up on that it. question. How about if we move on to health care? On March 23, 2010, President Obama signed the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act into law. It's kind of evolved into being called Obamacare, and I know uh, the president was quoted, uh, he, he said recently he kind of likes that. So uh, Obamacare was designed to move the focus of health care from treating the sick to keeping people healthy. Since, since its, its inception, it's been very divisive. The two of you have espoused very different opinions on the measure. What are its pros and cons, and do you think it will be repealed? And we'll start with Mr. Nolan. Well, I, I think the Affordable Care Act is a good beginning in, in many respects. It provides uh, that an additional 30 million Americans will have uh, health insurance, and it's health insurance that uh, provides health care and preventive services uh, in a way that's much more affordable for those people who now are going to the emergency rooms where it's much more expensive and oftentimes too late uh, to catch uh, medical problems before they become very expensive. Uh, some of the other pros are, of course, that um, it provides mandatory preventive services. It uh, requires um, a mandatory coverage for pre-existing conditions, and um, it's just a, a very good beginning. And um, um, we, we don't know for sure how well all the aspects of it are going to work out. Anytime you implement a, a program of this size and this scope, uh, to be sure, there's probably going to have to be some changes made, but I, I don't think it, it's appealed. Uh, by any measure. Um, one of the examples of some of the benefits uh, to it that are, that are not apparent is, is that right now, um, everybody in this room, uh, we may all be insured by the uh, same company, but uh, if you get into a, if we're, all, if we're all sitting here in a waiting room, we all have a different policy. And the administration of that just becomes un believably costly. And this bill has some procedures for streamlining that entire uh, administrative process. The insurance industry estimated that it, it might save us as much as a trillion dollars a year just in administrative costs. So we want to see how this thing unfolds and see how it works, make changes where it's necessary, but it's very important to get all of Americans insured in some kind of a good uh, universal health insurance plan. Mr. Kovac, I don't think you feel the same. No. Um, I've been dealing with the Obamacare for, gosh, for the last two years, uh, as soon as we stepped, uh, stepped into Congress. And one of the things that I took back, just as a citizen, um, and looking at when, uh, when the Affordable Care Act was actually voted in, uh, no one read the bill. Admittedly, no one read it. It did not go through the normal committee process. Um, it came to the floor two hours uh, prior to the vote. Uh, by Speaker Pelosi at the time. Uh, no one had the opportunity to read it, 2,700 pages, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of references. And it's even, it's even now uh, the bureaucrats in Washington are only halfway through it, and they've created another 30,000 pages of rules and regulations. And nobody really knows how it's going to affect people. 
Uh, that is that is pretty much for starters. No one read the bill. We've already seen some bad parts of the bill we were able to repeal. The 1099, how that was going to adversely affect uh, small businesses. Uh, in addition, uh, the Class Act, which even uh, Administrator Sebelius came in uh, committee and said it is completely unsustainable. That was for long-term health insurance. That people that were paying into long health insurance was being robbed and taken over into um, into Obamacare. Uh, what it's doing to Medicare, for example, uh, creation of the IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which is an unelected, unaccountable board uh, by 15 uh, members that uh, will be making uh, health care decisions and pay for payments of what. Uh, what our seniors are going to uh, go, going to be reimbursed, and as a doctor told me that it has worked very closely with Obamacare, he said you may have health insurance, but you may not have health care because I may not be, uh, do a procedure for what the IPAB is willing to pay, and with that you can't even use your own money with that doctor and say I'll pay the difference. So there's a lot of problems with Obamacare, but in, in two minutes it's tough to. Talked about the pros and cons, and I'll yield back. Mr. Nolan, you have one minute for rebuttal. All right, real, real quick, like, uh, you know, there are a number of factors that have to be considered here. Uh, one is, uh, Chip pointed out that nobody read the bill. I'm, I'm not sure I know about that, whether that's correct or not. But I do know that the Congress deliberated and debated that thing for uh, the better part of a year. So I think most people had a pretty good idea of what was in it. Uh, you say we don't know how it's going to be affected by small business. Well, I'm a small businessman, and I know anybody under 50 employees are exempt. And when it comes to I iPads, Chip, um, you know, if you did read the bill, you would know what that, uh, that, uh, that the, uh, the panels are accountable. That is reviewable uh, by the Congress of the United States. And you should also know that private insurance uh, companies have their own little iPads. At some point, someone has to decide whether or not we're going to reimburse the voodoo doctor uh, in the same manner that we reimburse the, uh, the, the cardiologist. So that's just a fact of life uh, about, about insurance. At some point, someone has to sit there and decide uh, who's going to pay for what. But it is reviewable by the Congress. Mr. Kovac, one minute. Um, I, I'm, I talk to small business owners all the time. And I just talked to one a couple weeks ago that has 55 employees. Uh, he said that he's letting five people go because he wants to stay below the 50 mark. Uh, I've also talked to uh, other, uh, other uh, larger corporations uh, like Stryker, for example, in, in uh, health medical devices. They're letting 5% of their people go directly because of Obamacare. And though the IPAB may be reviewable for uh, a member of Congress, they can't do anything. They can suggest, but they can't enforce. Right now, if you're having a problem with Medicare, I can do something about it because I'm your elected representative, and these bureau uh, the bureaucrats have to listen to an elected representative. If the IPAB is unaccountable and unelectable by anyone, I really don't have a power as your representative to assist you with a Medicare problem. All right, since you brought up the topic of Medicare, let's talk about it. It's an area in which you two have quite different approaches. Uh, Mr. Kravak, you've supported a program called Premium Support, um, saying something has to be done differently or Medicare will simply go away. And Mr. Nolan, you've said Medicare works, should be left alone, but what about when the money runs out? So could you talk a little bit about Medicare for me and how you would plan to handle it? Mr. Kravak, you go first. Well, we have a plan. Uh, we have a plan, uh, a house plan, that has been introduced. Uh, everybody needs to know that Medicare is insolvent in 2022. That means uh, there will be a 26%, if we do nothing, there will be a 26% reduction in services by Medicare uh, so that they can remain solvent. We have a plan. But if you're 55 years and older, nothing changes for you. Everything remains the same. But if you're 54 years and younger, like my generation, uh, we're going to have to do something because if we don't have any, if we don't do something, we will have nothing. Uh, so it, it's almost like a dereliction of duty. We, you, you, the people of the 8th District sent me to Washington to make hard decisions. And this is one of those hard decisions that we had to make. We developed a plan that if you're 55 years and younger, because if you're 55 years and older, nothing changes. If you're 54 years and younger, you will have options. You'll be able to, it's very similar to Advantage plan uh, under Medicare now. Or it's very similar to what uh, federal employees get right now as well. But, so you will have options of what type of insurance plan that you want, whatever pertains to you. One plan is also traditional Medicare. So 
future seniors will not be spending any more money than current seniors do today because if you want to have traditional Medicare, you can, or if you want a full premium support, you can have that as well as a private plan. And if you take the one plan that's less than the full premium support plan, you actually get a rebate. Mr. Nolan? What do you say? Um, <clears throat> Chip, Chip, would you like Chip, me to go again? Chip, Chip here's the deal. <laughs> here's the de Chip, Chip, here's the deal. Um, you have a plan. And uh, the Wall Street Journal, the Economist, everyone says it's to do away with Medicare as we know it. Give seniors a coupon uh, and tell them to go find their insurance in the private sector. Most anal analysts say that it would cost uh, seniors an additional uh, six, seven thousand um, dollars in out-of-pocket expenses. And here's here's the deal in this Ryan budget. And let's get this straight, because uh, here's what happened. You voted to cut $716 billion out of Medicare and to use that money for tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires. Now, the Affordable Care Act also cut $716 billion out of Medicare, turned around, put that money right back into Medicare, uh, used that money to close the, uh, the donut hole and to extend the life of Medicare, because to be sure, we have to do some things to make uh, sure that uh, Medicare is economically uh, viable uh, for the future. But in doing that, through the Affordable Care Act, the long-term financial viability of Medicare was extended by eight years. And had your plan gone through, uh, Medicare would be facing bankruptcy uh, in the next year and a half. So uh, let's get the truth out there. And all the fact checkers have checked this thing, Chip, and your allegations uh, with regard to uh, my support uh, for, the, for the, the plan that I've just outlined has been, all the fact checkers have said that, that your allegations are ridiculous, they're untruthful, they're misleading, the... Uh, a, the, the American Association of Retired People have, have said so, and um, um, you got to start telling the truth here about uh, what, what your plan does. It saves Medicare by doing away with it, uh, and I don't Mr. think we need that kind of salvation. Mr. Kovac? I'm so glad he brought up the $716 billion. Uh, the $716 billion in committee, finally they admitted, can't be used for two different things. You can't use it to extend Medicare and it's also pay for Obamacare. That's what exactly what the $716 billion did. It pays for Obamacare. Our seniors are being robbed from Medicare to pay for Obamacare. The PolitiFact lie of the year of 2011 was that we are planning to end Medicare. It's not a voucher system. It's a premium support system, seamless to uh, the Medicare recipient. Now, the $6,400 a year, even Doug Elmendorf, who is the director of office management and budget, and said that's a, that's a fabricated number. They don't even have the ability to come up with that number. That, again, was fact-checked and found to, uh, to be incorrect. We have a plan. It's a plan that was actually bounced off Alice Rivlin in the Clinton administration and also other members of Congress. We have a plan. Unfortunately, they don't, other than to let Medicare expire and go bankrupt. Mr. Nolan. Well, you know, <laughs> Chip, <laughs> The fact checkers found that uh, what you're saying just isn't true. It's not correct. Um, the uh, budget uh, committee found that there was $716 billion in Medicare that was being used to pay middlemen, uh, providers and insurance companies. Uh, and they figured that uh, if those $716 billion were taken out and not paid to the middlemen, and put back into Medicare, it would extend the uh, the long-term viability of it by a, a total of eight years. And, and, and Chip, that's what was done. And uh, you voted to take that same $116 billion out, which was the right thing to do, but then you turned around and gave it to tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires instead of putting it right back into Medicare where it belonged. All right, I want to bring the, the debate a little closer to home here now. Uh, a major dispute is raging in the 8th Congressional District over the potential for mining non-ferrous minerals. Can copper nickel be mined while protecting the environment, and how would you get involved in this issue? And we start with Mr. Kravak. Um, I've been involved with uh, 
PolyMet project since I, before I took the oath of office, actually. Uh, it was one of, that was actually one of my first meetings, was a meeting with PolyMet and trying to find out how we could expedite um, now eight years and I think $45 million of environmental impact studies to equal one job. Um, so I've been involved with this process. I do believe that we can um, mine precious metals in a safe environmental way. We live here. This is our home. Uh, I just spoke with PolyMet last week. Uh, very good progress. Uh, their, their modeling concepts are complete. They're going into the testing phase, and they're moving forward. Now, this means jobs. This means 300 to 350 full-time jobs. You can double that, and those will be direct ancillary jobs on top of that. And these are good, high-paying jobs. In addition to that, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of construction jobs for a very long period of time. Um, my goal, I also was able to initiate within the uh, Natural Resources Committee a streamlining amendment, which would uh, streamline these projects to 30 months. It does not take away one environmental protection. But what what it does do, if there's if the state is doing the same study as a federal program, why are we doing both? Let's do one. Let's streamline this effect to create jobs. Now, my goal is to after after the PolyMet project starts winding down, we're going to start spooling up the, the Ely project, Twin Metals project up in Ely. That's another 2,000 to 2,500 full-time jobs. And in addition to, I mean, we're talking thousands of jobs. It's a different kind of mining. It's an underground slant mine. My goal, my vision for the 8th District of Minnesota is to have people moving into the 8th District for good, high-paying jobs. I truly believe that we can be the Bakken fields of taconite and precious metal mining. That's my goal for the 8th. Mr. Nolan? Well, I'm, I'm very excited about the potential for mining here in our future. We're sitting on uh, 4 billion tons of some of the world's most uh, pre precious metals that are so vitally needed in the advanced technologies of our economy. And uh, I, I, too, have been involved with mining uh, literally all my life. I grew up here on the Iron Range, the Cuyuna Range. Uh, we have a magnesium project that's underway just uh, a few miles north of where our family saw me and pallet factory is located and uh, it, it just represents a great opportunity for us to supply so many of the precious metals that are needed in the future economy of this world and, and to create jobs and to uh, build opportunities and uh, build communities uh, in the process and we know how to do it and uh, we know how to do it right and, uh, you know, in the past, there was this, always this argument about uh, whether or not we're going to have jobs or whether or not we're going to protect the environment. I've met with the uh, mining companies as well. They don't have any problem uh, meeting uh, the uh, regulations that provide for clean air and clean water. Uh, they do have a problem with the process, and understandably so. I mean, it just, it just clearly uh, takes too long. But the days when you had to choose between one and another, th those are over with. And nobody loves the great outdoors uh, any more than the people in the 8th District here. Uh, that's what brought many people here. That's what's kept people here. Um, that's what continues to bring people here. We love our forest. We love our lakes. We love our hunting. We love our fishing. And we understand that mining... Mining is the backbone of our economy, and we are going to do everything possible to make sure that we become the mining region uh, for the future of not only this country and for the world, and we're going to go ahead with it, and we're going to do it, and we're going to do it right. So I understand you both agree, you both support mining, but there are differences in your opinion, and it, it's in how to get there. Mr. Kravak, if you could uh, follow up for us. Well, I would just like to bring out a little inconvenient truth that your campaign has been uh, funded by the Conservation League of Conservation of Voters that is the parent company, fully funded, I might add, uh, which is the parent company of uh, Minnesota, uh, Conservation Minnesota, uh, which, had a, which was behind uh, actually creation of a plank in the DFL state convention that wanted to eliminate uh, precious metal mining, in addition to uh, highly curtail uh, taconite uh, mining altogether. So uh, the inconvenient truth, is, and also Al Gore also supported you as well, but uh, um, the, the thing is, who uh, 
you know, you're, you're saying you're for mining, but the people that are backing you are trying to shut down mining in the 8th District, and then and that means jobs, not allowing to have precious metal mining expand, eliminating that, and also taconite mining as well. Mr. Nolan. Well, the people who are backing me, I see many of them here in the room today. They're the United Steelworkers here of Minnesota's 8th Congressional District, and I am doggone proud to, to have their support. And if you want to look through my uh, financial reports, you'll see contributions from uh, not only the men and women who work in these mines, but also uh, people that work in the corporate offices of these mines, too. Um, I uh, Mining has been a big part of my life. It always will be. And um, if you want to talk about about who's getting contributions from whom we can go in there you know we can talk about the money your campaign's getting from las vegas billionaires and the coke brothers and the millions of dollars that are pouring in from all over the country so um, i don't think we want to go there i think we can agree that we support um we, we can. Uh, we we, can. <laughs> we, I'll, I'll be glad to, but I, the question's about mining. And the th fact is is that we, uh, we, we uh, apparently both support mining. It's a obviously integral part. It's been part of my life all my life. Everybody in my neighborhood, everybody in my community worked in the mines. And we've got great opportunities for expanding those opportunities in mining in the future. We, we talked a lot about jobs here. What we haven't talked about too much is the environment. And there's a lot of people, obviously, a lot of people support jobs. A lot of people are concerned about the environment when we uh, we get into this. Um, Polymet has spent almost 10 years now and $46 million so far to get to where it is at this point. There are other companies not too far behind, but also facing that $46 million. Do we have too many regulations or not enough regulations? Mr. Nolan. Um. You know, again, I don't think it's a matter of too many or, or too few. Um, like I said earlier, I've, I've met with the people at Polymet and Twin Metals and the other companies. They don't have a problem um, with uh, meeting the regulations. They believe in clean air and clean water, and uh, they have a great love of the outdoors as well. They do have a legitimate grievance. Uh, the Polymet uh, process should not take, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten years and, uh, you know, forty, fifty million dollars. We need to expedite that process and that's the kind of thing that you know I think a, a good congressman uh, could do you know Chip you introduced a bill to expedite the process but uh, I noticed it didn't have any bipartisan support didn't have any serious uh, companion uh, legislation over in the Senate side and and I know you've held a lot of meetings and a lot of hearings but you know I hear a lot of people say you know that's all show and, and, and no go uh, you've had a couple of years to, to get this uh, project approved and uh, I, I don't don't see it uh, being improved. Maybe there's something going on that the rest of us are, are unaware of. I have I have a history both in business and in in public office of bringing people together. Um, you can you can go up here to Bluefin Bay and and talk to the owners and they'll tell you how I got that project by approved by by getting everybody in the room together and getting it past uh, DNR uh, objections at the time. You can go talk to the mayor of Albertville, uh, Cornelius Paulson. I saw him the other day and he was so happy with uh, the fact that I had uh, gone with that city uh, to the EPA offices in Chicago and the EPA offices in, in Minneapolis and got their projects approved and, and helped turn that town into a sleepy little uh, metro a sleepy little town of about 700 to a thriving metropolis of about 7,000. So at some point you got to roll up your sleeves, you got to get everybody in the room together and you say we're not getting out of here, we're not leaving, we're going to lock the door if we have to until we come up with an answer, until we come up with a solution until we get the job done. Mr. Kravak. Uh, to answer the question, EPA regulations uh, are probably one of the biggest impediments on, um, on growth for mining jobs and also our logging community as well. Um, if you take, uh, Congressman Nolan has actually come out and said that EPA regulations create jobs. Well, they might create jobs in Washington, D.C., but they definitely do not create jobs here in the range. Uh, I've talked to plenty of mining uh, people in the mining industry and the logging industry, and the uh, EPA has just uh, gone wild these last couple of years, to be honest with you. That's because their funding has increased by 99% as well. So, you know, uh, the regulations, uh, we have the streamlining amendment so that we can get rid of these duplicative amount of regulations, uh, these excessive reg regulations. We all want to take care of our water and our air. We live here. This is our home. 
So we want to do that. The streamlining regulation simply does it that. It streamlines the regulations so that we can get projects like PolyMet and projects like the Twin Metals Project up and running as quickly as possible to create jobs. Jobs at the end of the day is what we're, what we're all about. We have to, we want to live here. We don't want our children being exported out. Now, as my, your former opponent and, and actually uh, uh, your current staffer, uh, Jeff Anderson said, he actually backed my streamlining amendment thinking that it was on target. You proposed having a institute that would keep mining uh, under the microscope and increasing studies. Well, studies do not make jobs. What we need to do is have jobs. And by uh, creating uh, the streamlining amendments, getting PolyMet rolling again, get, uh, get the Twin Metals project rolling, being able to get magnetation to go where it needs to go, get uh, misogamy nugget, uh, the permits that they need, that is how we create jobs. That is how people uh, create demand. That is how this area is going to grow and become prosperous and have two different uh, mining cycles of uh, taconite in addition to precious metals. So the boom and the bust is a little bit equaled out. Mr. Nolan. Well, uh, Chip, there are about 50 basic research centers um, in the country, and the Republicans did away with the Bureau of Mines in, in research and development uh, back in the 90s. Uh, what I proposed is, is that we have up here in the 8th District a research institute uh, to develop new technologies, and I don't know if you're aware of it, but it was the University of Minnesota who developed the uh, taconite technology that has brought about such a great boom to our industry. We're not talking about studying reviews and approval procedures. We're talking about fundamental, basic research. Find better ways for us to uh, advance our, our mining uh, technologies uh, and, and our industries up here in uh, Minnesota's Eighth uh, Congressional District. That that proposal has been endorsed by no less than the uh, National Mining Association, uh, the University of Duluth, the uh, Iron Range uh, Natural Resource Center, uh, by the uh, land grant colleges. Um, if, if we're going to take full advantage of the great opportunities we have for mining here in the future, we need to be also spending some money on basic research for the technologies of the future. That's how you get these projects approved. This is a $250 million project. And um, again, we don't need more studies. We need jobs. No, we're not talking about and, studies. We're talking no, about basic let, let research. Let minute. <laughs> we, we, don't, we need jobs. Um, actually, Jeff Anderson uh, echoed, echoed uh, my belief in that. Now, the thing is, UMD does an excellent job in studying mining. Now, I don't want to have to make a decision for grants. Do I have to pick UMD, or am I going to have to pick uh, a, a new institute? Uh, I think UMD does an exceptional job. I want to keep that program up and running so that we can keep uh, we can also keep the the money into the into the college but at the same time we need to create jobs we do not continue on with the studies we have to create the jobs get the mines open get people back to work that's my job all right, I want to stay with mining for a minute. I want to talk about uh, switching minerals, though. I, the demand for iron ore is falling. Might even result in some mines shutting down, at least shutting down some lines next year for a while. What can you, as a congressman, do on behalf of the iron ore mining industry to help give it more stability? And we'll start with you, Mr. Kovac. It's the economy. We have to get the economy rolling again. We got to. We have to increase the demand for uh, taconite for steel. Uh, we have to have pro-growth tax reform that creates a simpler, flatter, fairer system. We have to have uh, our corporate tax rates uh, come down from 35 percent down to 25 percent, which is the global minimum, uh, global average right now. And again, I've said I've tried to. Um, talk them into even making it lower, but we have to incentivize uh, businesses to bring jobs back to the United States and getting the economy rolling in, buying more cars, people having more confidence and, uh, and, and being able to buy the new washing machine. At the same time, we have to start, we have to talk about regulations. We have to make sure that uh, the excessive amount of regulations that are coming out of Washington right now are cut back. My goal is to have Washington partner with business and say, look, we, we, need to, we need to have clean air. We want you to have clean air. How can we work with you to achieve, one, that we get the clean air and you have a viable product? We've already instituted that. It's called the RAINS Act. 
Uh, well, you passed it on the House side with bipartisan support, and it's sitting dead in the Senate because Senator Reid won't take it up. It's a good bill. It's a pro-jobs bill. It's a pro-growth bill. And Senator Reid has blocked it from coming uh, to the House floor. To get taconite mining from that boom and bust is to get the economy rolling again. By getting the economy rolling again, well, there will be a demand for steel, especially on international markets as well. When the, you know, it's the old saying, when, when the United States sneeze, the, the world gets a cold. You know, when the United States economy starts prospering again, the world's economy is going to start prospering again, and the demand will be there. Mr. Nolan? Well, um, gee, I'm going to agree with you again here. We need to get the economy rolling. Um, the difference is, is how you go about doing that, Chip. And um, uh, the fact is that um, we do need to increase demand. And one of the ways you increase demand is by uh, investing some money in the rebuilding of our infrastructure. You, you voted to cut funding for our infrastructure. The amount of rebar, the amount of steel that goes into building roads and bridges is a critically important component of developing the market for our taconite and the ultimate steel products. Uh, similarly, um, uh, we need to... Uh, change our tax and trade policy. Uh, you've been voting to provide more tax breaks for people uh, to move their manufacturing offshore. We need to keep that manufacturing here. That that creates more demand for steel here in America. Um, you, uh, uh, I, I believe, and uh, I, need, I know at least Romney, you know, said let let the uh, um, let uh, Detroit go bankrupt. Um, the president went in and rescued it. I think there's several thousand uh, pounds of steel that uh, goes into the uh, manufacturing and production of every automobile. Uh, we need to advance um, further processing of our taconite here. It makes no sense, quite frankly, to be sending our taconite to Cleveland and to China and all over the globe. We need uh, an initiative here to um, start processing steel right up here uh, in Minnesota's 8th Congestion District, where the iron ore is located. Again, creating jobs. And there's so many other things. You know, you voted against uh, expanding alternative energy solutions. Every windmill has like 335 uh, tons of steel in it. Um, they have like five tons of copper in it. Um, that's the kind of uh, initiative that uh, we as a nation should be investing in. Again, creating more demand for more steel. That's how you create jobs. That's how you create a sustainable Kavak, steel industry. One minute follow up. And regarding the uh, infrastructure bill that uh, we talked, uh, the congressman talked about, uh, we actually passed an infrastructure bill. We passed a highway bill after nine extensions. Uh, the previous Congress, the 111th Congress, had a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate with filibuster proof, and a, a Democratic president. They couldn't pass a transportation bill. We did. And it took a lot of wrangling. It was an 18-hour committee meeting. I think it was uh, one of the longest committee meetings. 18-hour committee meeting. I was a conferee on the transportation bill. We worked together and got a transportation bill done. It's interesting to note, the previous transportation bill had 6,400 earmarks in it. This transportation bill had none. And we managed to work together to get it done, to get the country back on track, get our infrastructure that's, that's so badly needed uh, uh, worked upon. I want to ask a question that's very close to the heart of many of the young people in this audience. In 2009, that's the most recent data available, 67% of graduates had debt averaging $24,000 per student. It is higher now. It was up 6% then from the previous year. Private school debt's even higher. College debt has surpassed credit card debt in America. What can you do as a congressman to help those students? We begin with Mr. Nolan. Well, um, I'm the immediate uh, past volunteer president of the uh, Central Lakes Community College, so I know a little bit about what uh, we raise scholarship money for students of all ages, so I know a little bit about how students are, are struggling, and uh, I have uh, a, a 10 grandchildren as well uh, that live uh, here in the 8th District, and um, uh, the oldest of which is looking at, at college as, as we speak. Um, President Bill Clinton uh, was in um, Duluth yesterday, and he talked at great length about this. And President Obama has uh, submitted a, pro a program uh, to change the student loan program. 
um, and cut $60 billion out of it in bonuses that were going to banks. And um, in turning that over to the Department of Education, who would make those student loans uh, directly. And in the process, uh, that will be taking effect here in the next year. And in the process, uh, that will lower the student debt, uh, the repayment for a student, by $1,300 for each $1,000 in student, each $10,000 in student debt. So in, in the case you're talking about, that, that would uh, lower the repayments for up to 20 years uh, for a, a typical student loan in, in the $24,000 uh, category. Now, secondly, uh, the repayment would also be based uh, not on the, the, the uh, normal uh, payment schedule, but be based on your income. So if you uh, took a job as a doctor in a rural hospital where the income wasn't as great or teaching in a school where the, pay, the salaries weren't as good, uh, you wouldn't have to pay as high a percentage of your income. Now, Chip, you, 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 you uh, under the Ryan budget plan, have, have voted to do away with that. In addition, uh, you voted to um, uh, cut another $115 billion out of our educational funding. Mr. Kravak? Only in Washington, by voting not to have an increase, is it considered a decrease. Uh, the Pell Grants have gone up 139% over the last four years. But Pell Grants is, are symptomatic of a problem. The problem is the cost of education. Now, we all realize that health care costs have gone up significantly over the last couple of years. Uh, since uh, 1982, I believe, to 2007, I think the report said, uh, health care costs have gone up 250 uh, percent. Well, education costs during that same time period have gone up over 400 percent. Now, there's a reason for that. Now take a look at what some of the expenditures that some of our colleges and institutions uh, spend on. Uh, they're spend, you know, if you take a look at it, you know, 15-person hot tubs, uh, making sure mahogany windows have leaded glass, uh, things like that, uh, and professors uh, may be teaching eight to nine hours uh, a, a week. I told that to a to a high school student or a high school teacher. He just about fainted. Um, you know, so if we're asking our military to take a trillion dollars in cuts over the next 10 years to, for, to find efficiencies, uh, which I think are a little bit, a little bit uh, too deep, my opinion. But uh, we should ask, be asking our colleges that are having a, li a little bit uh, spending on the wrong things and ensuring that we spend the money on the child in the classroom so that they can be educated with the uh, training and techniques that they are going to need to be a productive member in our workforce. That's what we should be concentrating our money on. Mr. Nolan, uh, have you got a rebuttal? Um, yeah, you know, Chip, you are the beneficiary of a publicly uh, paid for uh, education, a great education, probably worth a half a million dollars at the Naval Academy, and I know that you are deserving and uh, that you earned that, and I applaud you for that. Thank you. Um, but for you to turn around and vote against Pell Grants uh, for low-income and medium-income kids to go to college when the cost of a, of, of, a, of a community college education now is up to $7,000. And trust me, uh, there are no uh, hot tub programs here at Masabi uh, Community <laughs> College. Um, I've been through this college, and they have, by the way, one of the finest uh, engineering programs that's become a model for the country. But it's costing uh, $7,000 a year now for a, a, a student to, to live at home and go to a community college. And we're putting a college education out of the reach of an average person, and we need to start investing more money in our kids and our education. And uh, Mr. Kravak, one minute. Now, I will, I will agree. The cost of education has increased dramatically. We need to bring the cost of education down. But once again, even the president said that the Pell Grants were on unstable footing and that needed to be reformed. I agree with the president on this one. And he so, reformed it, too. Good for him. Okay. I, I, we, I, <laughs> in, in regards, I appreciate your comments. Uh, in regards to the United States Naval Academy, you, you realize both as congressmen that we do nominate uh, men and women to go uh, to the academies. But I, I, I do take exception with your uh, comment that you called that you said I was on the public dole all of my life, uh, being a military member. 
Um, I did take exception to that, and uh, I do not think the men and women that serve in our armed forces are on the public dole. They're an essential part of our fighting forces, and they're an essential part of uh, making sure that we have a protected nation. We got off topic a little bit there, but that happens. Uh, we promised uh, all of you out in the audience that we would take some questions, and uh, the students have been collecting those questions. I thank you. We have a whole handful here. So we'll be looking at these questions together, gentlemen. Uh, the first question is from Stephanie of Hibbing. She says, and it's, it's on the right topic. She <laughs> says, Minnesota students pay the third highest tuition and fees in the country at public two-year colleges. What will you do to make college more affordable? And I think it is Congressman Kravak's turn to start. Again, thank you, Stephanie, for your question. And it's apropos. Uh, how do we make it? Uh, part of it is working with the state on, for public institutions on, on uh, seeing what efficiencies we can make within the different colleges uh, to get costs down. Because the bottom line is we have to get costs down. It, it, the trajectory of spending and costs for uh, colleges is just astronomical. Um, the president, like I said, has even come out and said it is unsustainable, the trajectory that we on, we're on. We have to create efficiencies so that we can do the most important thing that any parent can do, and that's educate your children, so that, that when they go out into the workforce, they can have a viable trade, a viable profession, and be a uh, productive citizen of the United States. Mr. Nolan? Um, you know, not just a few few years ago, um, the United States was first in the world in the number of college students who, who graduated from universities, and we've recently dropped to 16th. And it's largely because it's just unaffordable for so many people to even contemplate and think about going to college. And that's because we've been cutting funding uh, for our universities and passing the burden on to the students. When I went to the university, it cost us 100 bucks a quarter because our parents had put money into the university system, and we got to start funding our education. We spent a trillion dollars in the war in Iraq. That was enough right there to fund all the student loans in America for the last 10 years. It's about priorities. And Debate Minnesota has decided not to do rebuttals on the questions from the audience, so we'll continue with the next question, for which you'll get each one minute. This is from Barbara Mahoney of Duluth. What will you do to preserve Pell Grant funding? And we start with you, Mr. Nolan. Well, I'll fund them. That's what I'll do. <laughs> um, um, and uh, the congressman has voted to cut funding for Pell Grants. And uh, according to the uh, analysis that I've seen, that uh, is denying uh, uh, funds for some uh, 23,000 students uh, here uh, in just the state of Minnesota alone. And um, more importantly, um, you know, the president did propose some very nice reforms for the uh, P uh, Pell Grant uh, program that are saving us a lot of money and making more uh, affordable loans available uh, to more students. Now, there's more that we can do. We need to start funding our universities and our colleges and our elementary and secondary schools, but particularly at the college level so that uh, the students are constantly not being ex ex expected to uh, to pay the price with ever-increasing tuition. There's nothing more important, you're right, than the education of our children. That's where our economic future is. That's where opportunities lie. That's where we need to start investing money, not being the world's policeman. Mr. Kravak. Uh, again, uh, only in Washington does you know, not getting an increase equal a cut uh, in regards to that. Uh, uh, funding for Pell Grants, the amount of, uh, that actual student actually received has not changed, uh, but it has, we had to plateau it. We're $16 trillion in debt, um, $16 trillion. To put that kind of in perspective, um, a, a billion seconds ago, we were all 31 years younger. A trillion seconds ago was 31,688 years. Uh, we are deeply, deeply in debt, and we have to find the efficiencies. Uh, if we don't get our economy and get jobs rolling back in the 8th District, it doesn't matter how well educated our children are going to be because they're not going to have jobs. So the essence is, uh, like even the president said, the president said that the Pell Grant was on unstable footing and we need to have, uh, to have a corrective action. And, but the bottom line is these young people need jobs once they graduate. So they're not living in your basements. 
Our next question comes from Bill of Ely. He says, where do you stand on Mitt Romney's stand on turning over FEMA and the federal government disaster relief to the individual state? And the question first goes to Mr. Kravak. I'd have to take a look at that proposal a little bit more. Um, that was rather, you know, it's, it, there's really nothing hard in stone or... Um, Right now, of course, uh, with the Duluth uh, floods, uh, FEMA responded pretty well in, in making sure that the public infrastructure uh, was uh, addressed. Uh, we tried to have a little bit more because it you know, affected very many of our homes and uh, private, uh, private residences. Um, but at the same time, uh, they were there, they responded, they were quick. Uh, but I would, I'd really have to defer and wait until I see some some hard language, uh, what the, what uh, Governor Romney has to say. Mr. Nolan? Um, no, I, I would uh, be uh, strongly opposed to that. Uh, what we're witnessing here in the northeastern United States, what we witnessed uh, here in northeastern Minnesota, what we've witnessed um, in uh, Louisiana, in New Orleans, clearly requires a, a federal response where you can pull together the assets of a region uh, to move quickly and to protect lives and to help uh, these communities that have been devastated uh, to rebuild. And uh, uh, FEMA, you know, every, everybody's always complaining about government this and government that, you know, until they need it. You know, and you, you come across a, a car accident on the highway and you see the highway patrol and the state patrol and you see the rescue squad and you see the ambulance and you, you see the helicopter coming in to take people to the hospital and everybody knows what they're doing and they're saving lives. Uh, it's doggone uh, useful and uh, to have uh, a good government there when you need it and the people in the Northeast need it now and we needed it up here in the Northeast here a year ago and or earlier this year and uh, I would not turn it over to the states. All right, our next question comes from Patty in Cook. Patty asks, what is the role of a congressman in working with state legislators and local officials? Our uh, first question now goes to Mr. Nolan. Um, you know, there, there, there are a couple different roles for a good member of Congress. One is you're there to vote on the great issues of our time. Do we go to war? Do we save Medicare? Uh, do we give more tax rates to the rich? Uh, do we refocus on rebuilding the economy from the middle out and up or trickle down from the, uh, the, the rich? And, and, uh, but in addition to that, a good congressman has to be an advocate for his district. Chip, I was shocked to learn. Uh, here just recently I was talking with the mayor of Duluth and he was telling me how he has sent you three letters he has asked numerous times uh, to have a meeting with you to talk about projects that are important to the city of Duluth and he hasn't been able to get a response that's the kind of thing I hear all the time when I'm traveling around the district you've got to be an advocate for your community you've got to be an advocate for your business uh, you've got to make sure that you do everything you can to roll up your sleeves and make sure things get done for people and communities here in this district. Mr. Kravak. Uh, I think we actually resemble exactly what Patty was talking about. Uh, for our Boundary Water Canoe Area school land swap, uh, we, we'd been working on a bill for over a year. And when the state legislator um, and the governor signed a different bill, we completely trashed ours. And uh, completely adopted um, the uh, state state's bill, and uh, moved it forward uh, through committee, through subcommittee, committee, and then also uh, on the house floor uh, for a very uh, interesting debate on the house floor to get it passed and sent over to the Senate, where it is in hover mode. So uh, hopefully our senators will will pick that up. Um, in regards to our the mayor you're referring to. Um, we, uh, we uh, replied to the mayor and reminded him of some correspondences that we did send him um, that uh, he must have forgotten about and some telephone calls that uh, we documented as well. So uh, we are very responsive uh, to all the, all the mayors. Uh, we've had four mayor roundtables and over 400 mayors have been invited to these roundtables. All right, Cal and Eveleth asks, is the EPA overreaching its scope? Are the MPCA rules sufficient to protect our environment while adding new mining projects like polymet and twin metals? And this question goes first to you, Mr. Kravak. I think the EPA is dramatically uh, overreaching uh, in a case in point in a couple different areas. 
Uh, one is uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control was working very well uh, with the mines on regard regards to a haze issue. Um, Minnesota Pollution Control worked with the mines. Everything was fine. The EPA swoops in and said, this is going to have to be done in 18 months. Well, it, it's Impra practically impossible to put the type of low NOx burners on the individual uh, burners uh, furnaces that uh, that are in our mines. It, this may cost jobs. Uh, what we did in response is we created a bill and uh, dropped the bill that puts a 10-year moratorium on any type of EPA regulation that would try to impose a, uh, a haze standard, which is the leads the leads are supposed to be the states, and we dropped that bill to uh, to prevent that occurring. Mr. Nolan, um, you know, again, I've I've talked with the mining companies up here. They don't have a problem meeting the regulations. Uh, they, they believe in clean air and uh, clean water, and uh, they believe in protecting our forests and our great outdoors. Yes, that is the, the that is the fact. Um, what they do is they have a problem with how long the process takes, and uh, we need to do some work there. But the way you get things done um, in Washington is by rolling up your sleeves, not by coming home and going hitting the camp pain trail. Of, of course, there's opposition to anything and everything that anyone uh, tries to do. But again, you know, your little, uh, your, your land swap bill, I, I applaud you for, for making the effort. Uh, but again, you, you didn't have any bipartisan support. You didn't have uh, any serious companion uh, legislation on the Senate side. Um, that's not going to go anywhere. Uh, you know, you have a record of just, you know, having a hearing, having a meeting, uh, throwing a bill in there, uh, kind of all show and no go. And that's not how you get stuff done. You roll up your sleeves and you stay there and you work until you reach agreement. All right, moving on to our next question. It's from Jewel in Babbitt. She asks, what is the role of the EPA? Do you see, an, and so it's sort of continuing this question, do you as a candidate see any correlations between the coal industry in America and the future of mining in Minnesota? And our first question goes to Mr. Nolan. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm going to answer a, a question you talked about here a little bit earlier. Um, the EPA... Um, has, has done a, a relatively good job of giving us a clean air and clean water. And in the process, back in the 70s and the 80s, all the economic analysts said that it created more jobs than anything. Chip, the fact is, you know, we were looking at acid rain destroying our lakes and our forest up here. But guess what? You know, we had some regulations, but someone had to build the scrubbers. Uh, someone had to install the scrubbers. Somebody has to maintain the scrubbers. Somebody has to replace the scrubbers that take the that took the sulfuric emissions uh, out of our air. In Detroit, someone had to construct the uh, the catalytic converters. Uh, somebody had to build them, to maintain them, to replace them. The fact is, the environmental industry has been a very very strong component of creating jobs uh, uh, here in this country. Now, again, we need to expedite the process. But uh, if you can't sit here and say that environmental rules and regulations have not created jobs. On the contrary, they have. Mr. Kravak. Um, just a comment on uh, rolling up your sleeves, and I, I, I agree with that. Uh, we did roll up our sleeves. As a, fresh, as a, member, a freshman member, we have two red line bills that have gone and uh, that have gone through the house through the senate and signed by the president which actually is quite unprecedented in regards to uh julie i appreciate the comment regarding coal there is a war on coal and this war on coal is going to directly affect taconite mining and the reason why i say that is the two power plants tack harbor and also laskin power plant uh, in hoyt lakes now uh, by the way which uh, pays over 70 percent of the property taxes in hoyt lakes eight hundred and ten thousand dollars the, the two coal plants also provide each one individually, 50% of their power goes to taconite generation. If these two coal power plants get shut down, and that's what the EPA is trying to do through Minnesota Commerce, gets shut down, our taconite uh, mining uh, costs are going to escalate, which means that our taconite is going to be uh, less competitive and people are going to be out of work. So uh, we've also put a moratorium, uh, or we're fighting that battle as well. 
All right, we have a good question next, um, but somebody didn't put their name on it. You should have. It's a good question. It's uh, both candidates, both of you guys, have said Washington is somehow broken. Uh, do nothing, Congress. Uh, what needs to be done to get things moving and to fix this so called broken Washington? And our first question goes to you, Mr. Kovac. Uh, good question. I share your frustration uh, in Congress. I've got a little plaque on my wall that I take off. There's an X on it. It says, bang head here. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it is very frustrating. Uh, we've, uh, but you're half right, if I may interject. Uh, you're half right. The House has passed several bills uh, in a bipartisan ma nature. Uh, they have been passed. They go over to the Senate, and Harry Reid uh, does not bring them up. There, I think there's 39 of them now. One of will directly affects our uh, our uh, paper mills. So, but uh, these 39 bills are sitting over in the Senate. The Senate leader has the option to bring it to the floor. Uh, I'm saying, you know, let the bill fall or, or fail or succeed on its own merit, but at least Senator Reid please allow for the open, honest debate of the bill, because these are jobs bills. These means, jo these means jobs in America, and it's going to affect the 8th District of Minnesota. So, Mr. Nolan? Um, well, I think we really, truly need to change the way we do our politics. It seems as though everybody's raising money and campaigning, and very few people are doing very little governing. I, I quite frankly think we need to reverse Citizens United to take uh, the perverse influence that all this big money is having uh, in politics. And quite frankly, I think a, a federal election should be publicly funded uh, so that uh, representatives are beholden to the public, not the most well-financed uh, special interests. And, and secondly, I, I see no reason why we can't put some restrictions on the time that campaigns last. Right now they start uh, the day after the, uh, the, the last election and most uh, developed countries with uh, progressive democracies, you know, have a 60, 90 day election contest. But beyond that, you know, I'm able to keep my seniority. I've spent a lifetime bringing people together in volunteer community service, in business, in government, in politics. I wouldn't be running if I didn't think I could make a difference. I think Congress needs to go to work. I think they have to spend more time getting to know one another, building some respect for one another, finding where the areas of compromise can be reached, and rolling up their sleeves and getting things done. Uh, Chuck in Embarrass, uh, from Embarrass asks, Head Start is a program that has helped preschool children be ready to learn when they enter kindergarten. How would you support Head Start and other preschool, preschool programs for underserved children? And we start with Mr. Nolan. Well, I uh, directed uh, a 19-unit, uh, three-county uh, Head Start program here in the 8th District uh, some years ago. It's just a truly a wonderful program, and uh, we discovered uh, so many uh, ways that we could improve the uh, educational performance and capability of young people in preparing and, and getting ready for college, uh, uh, getting ready for grade school and, and high school. There are so many different uh, learning disabilities and disadvantages that that children have that uh, make them ill-prepared uh, for uh, entering into elementary and secondary school in Head Start is just a wonderful, wonderful way of uh, making those discoveries and providing whatever kind of uh, assistance is needed uh, for those young people to be able to go to school and to learn and to realize their full potential. I, I would definitely call for greater funding uh, for Head Start. I think uh, Head Start and uh, early childhood are just two of the best ways that we could ever invest our public funds and our public money. Mr. Nolan? I'm Mr. Kovac. <laughs> he already had his turn. We're, we're twins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Head Start is a good program, but the thing is the efficiencies right now uh, of the Congress, we have to be very selective on how we spend our money. Uh, we have to find the efficiencies where we can find them. Right now, we're, uh, we've had four straight trillion dollar deficits or $16 trillion in debt. 46% of our debt is foreign owned. 30% of that is owned by China. Uh, we have to be very selective if, uh, on how we create our efficiencies. And if Head Start shows the efficiencies that, that um, that uh, can prove that they have, uh, that the childhood development is, is uh, they're doing great things, uh, I'm all for it. But remember, every program that we, uh, that is over and considered in deficit spending, we're borrowing that child's future away from them. So it better be significant. 
Uh, John Forrest from Kewatin asked this question. How do you stand on the U.S. Senate plan to rescue the U.S. Postal Service? And this time I mean Mr. Kovac. I get all the easy ones, huh? Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the Postal Service right now, and talking to the Postmaster General, um, is obviously uh, working uh, in, in, the, in the red. Um, they have an impossible attack. The, gen the uh, technology has changed dramatically from people writing letters uh, to using emails. The paradigm has shifted significantly. And we have to create efficiencies. The, some of the things that uh, we were looking at was uh, taking some of the more senior members uh, that are in the Postal Service and giving them a pretty healthy package of uh, uh, asking them to retire, uh, this, which uh, seemed very positive in some of the, the union uh, members that we had spoken with. But we have to start creating efficiencies within the Postal Service because just technology has changed. And I look forward to leadership of the Postmaster General in uh, making those decisions. All right, Mr. Nolan. When I was a young man, well, first of all, my father worked for the post office for 47 years. And uh, when I was a young man and my father learned I was going to spend some time in government and politics, he said, son, if you just do a few things, I'll always be proud of you. It kind of symbolizes, Chip, the good and the bad of politics. He says, number one, I want you to always be honest, son. And uh, uh, secondly, he said, um, I want you to work for the common people and the common good. Don't worry about the rich. They got a way of taking care of themselves. And then he said, don't, don't ever vote against the Postal Service. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I just feel that the Postal Service has been one of the best things that ever happened uh, to this country. Uh, I know that a Postal Service to small towns is something that's very important. It makes more sense to drop the mail off at one small post office and it does to have everybody in that town, you know, driving 30 or 40 miles to the nearest town with a big post office. So uh, that's how we communicate. That's how we get our information from one another. And I am a very, very strong proponent and supporter of the U.S. Postal Service. All right. Jerry from Duluth asks, we were warned the last time the debt ceiling was raised that our credit rating would be lowered. Under that, under what circumstance would you raise the debt ceiling? Mr. Nolan. Well, that's one of the toughest votes you ever have to cast, and for the last 50, 60 years, I don't think it's ever passed by more than one vote. Um, and it's so easy for anyone uh, to sit there, and I know I can certainly say it, those aren't my spending priorities. Uh, if we're up to me, uh, we wouldn't have this kind of debt. We wouldn't have gotten involved in that war in Iraq. We wouldn't have spent that trillion dollars in Afghanistan. We wouldn't have uh, built that uh, new base in Okinawa. So it's so easy for anyone and everyone to say, I'm not going to raise that debt ceiling. But the fact is, you know, the government uh, of the United States, the people of the United States have obligated themselves to that debt, whatever it is. And the failure uh, to, to acknowledge that and raise the debt ceiling to make it necessary to pay for that is just a totally irresponsible. Um, it could it cause just a total financial collapse uh, of our whole economic system not to pay those bills that you've obligated your government and your people to pay. Mr. Kravac? I had to have two lists of the, the postmaster. One is the paymaster, and the other one is the doc. Don't mess with those guys either. But, uh, <laughs> okay. but uh, in regards to, um, you know, there are no blank checks. I found that early on in, in, as a freshman in Congress. You cannot keep on writing blank checks to the United States government and keep on kicking the can down the road and say, well, it, was, it, was, it wasn't my expense, therefore, uh, you know, I, I've got to write it off. We cannot continue kicking the can down the road. Uh, we are going to run into a financial crisis that you're seeing in Greece, uh, Portugal, Spain, and Italy. We're already 105% debt to GDP ratio. Greece is 158%. Uh, under the president's budget, it, 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 it screams past Greece. We have to be adults about this. There are no blank checks. So with any, any raising of the debt, there has to be with it spending cuts that eliminates deficit spending along with debt reduction. That's the only way to get out of this mess. All right. Our next question comes from Charles F. Fairbanks. He asks, what is your position on the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan? And we start with Mr. Kravak. Uh, I've gone on record it's time to come out of Afghanistan. 
Uh, I think it's time. Uh, the rules of engagement are not such that our troops can fight a full-fledged war. Uh, I do not want to see another trooper at the top of the Capitol steps that um, shake hands with and we thank for their service as they're missing their limbs. Um, one of the most significant moments that I remember and really struck home to me, I'm walking up the steps, and here is, here's a young sailor, actually, was work, uh, EOD. Um, he had both legs missing and both of his arms missing and had a mechanical arm that was shaking our hands when we went through. Uh, it's time to bring those guys and gals home um, and uh, l let the uh, Afghans uh, be able to defend themselves. Mr. Nolan. Well, we apparently have found some agreement here as well. That's three. Yeah, three. <laughs> um, I, I believe we should bring the, the troops home now. And, um, uh, you know, pl please beware, everyone. We've heard a lot of people say, well, I, I think we should bring the troops home as soon as possible. Uh, to John McCain, that might mean 20 or 30 years from now. So um, as soon as possible is, is the key word there. I believe we need to bring them home now, and I, 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 I gather that uh, Congressman Kravak agrees with me on that. All right, now before we go to our closing statements with that uh, you'll each have one minute for, we'd like to acknowledge that today's debate was made possible through the financial support of the Otto Bremer Foundation, Prairie Island Indian Community, and the Target Corporation. We'd like to thank Masabi Range Community and Technical College for hosting this debate on your lovely campus, even if you don't have a hot tub. <laughs> and, uh, and all the Minnesota State University Student Association volunteers, thanks also to Minnesota Public Radio for recording today's debate, which will air Thursday, November 1st at noon, and to the uptake for live streaming the debate online. Of course, also to all of the television, radio, print media, as well as the bloggers and tweeters in the audience. <laughs> On a personal note, the founder of Debate Minnesota, Will Hadlin, died last month. We honor his legacy by carrying on this important mission. Most importantly, we thank all of you in our audience here in Virginia and those watching on My9 and remind you that if you want to watch the debate again, we will replay it in its entirety tonight on My9 at 7 p.m. On now to our closing statements. And Mr. Kovac won the coin toss, and so we'll go. Actually, I lost. He lost, but yeah. you chose to go first, <laughs> right? No. no. No, Mr. Nolan goes first. <laughs> He, right. he won the first two, and I won the last one. Oh, so he goes first, and I get to go last. <laughs> okay, you get to go last. Well, go ahead. Oh. Take the floor. Well, I uh, thank everybody for coming here today. Uh, I truly appreciate the opportunity. I'd like to thank Barbara. Thank you for being an excellent moderator. Very much appreciate that. Masabi uh, College here, appreciate your, uh, extending your hospitality to us as well. And Congressman Nolan, our fourth and final debate. Yeah. It's been a heck of a season. <laughs> um, I know at times have been tough. Everything from gas, groceries to education has gone up in price. But that is what we have, is we have a plan for moving forward. Uh, our plan is a little bit different than Congressman Nolan's. Uh, Congressman Nolan has a plan. It's a little bit more of an antiquated style of government. It's bigger government, more spending, more regulation, and I think more deficit, more debt, and more decline. Uh, we have a plan of moving forward, positive growth plan. Well, I know we're not going to solve all the problems here tonight. I know it's going to take a lot of work to get our people back to work and our economy back on track. I humbly and respectfully ask for your vote to report for duty once again in January of next year and have the honor and the privilege to serve the men and women of the 8th. Thank you. Mr. Nolan. Um, thank you very much. You know, in, in some respects, I, I guess I do want to go back uh, to the past, like the, like the uh, Clinton years when we had balanced budgets and surpluses and full employment and we weren't involved in any wars around the country and we were taking care of the human uh, needs here in this country and the middle class was strong. We have a very, very clear choice in this election contest. Clearly, we have to balance our budgets. We have to uh, get this country back to work and get it back on track but we have a very, very different uh, plan and agenda for doing that. But Congressman Kravak would do away with Medicare as we know it. He would provide more tax cuts for the super rich. He would provide more tax cuts for companies to uh, move their jobs offshore. And he's made it clear that he would also uh, like to see the privatization of Social Security. We have about as clear a choice as we have ever had in an election contest. And I, too, uh, ask for your vote. Ask for your support, and I thank you for all the consideration you've all given both of us here in this election contest. Well, Chip Kravak and Rick Nolan, thanks very much, and thanks to all of you. Go ahead and applaud.